If you don't know us, if you're new, I'm not sure I see anyone yet that doesn't know us. But hey, we are Scott and Susan Williams. I don't know if I see anything. I know, that's true. <laughs> uh, for those of you that are here today that haven't been here before, we've got different ways that we worship um, here in the church. We have communion, and today we're going to do an all-church communion. So if you wait till we do that, that would be great, and we'll do it as one body. And um, ways that we worship at Downtown Vineyard, we've got our giving, of course. That's an act of worship, if you guys don't know that. But giving our tithes and offerings is an act of worship. So we've got our giving boxes up here in the front, at the back. Um, on each side of the sanctuary are the boxes for your tithes and offerings. I think there's one maybe up in the balcony even. Well, if there's not, there should be. <laughs> so we also have candles here. You'll see some people come up and and uh, light a candle as they, they're praying. It's just representing a tangible way of uh, uh, saying a prayer. And so It represents a prayer that you're praying. Yep. So you feel free to light a candle to represent a prayer. Whether you feel like it's a little tiny prayer, it doesn't matter because God wants to hear all of our prayers, and a candle just represents that prayer. And a lot of times I get prompted to pray for somebody while they're lighting a candle, mm -hmm. thinking, no, whatever they're going through, God help them. Yeah. So. Awesome. All right. We'll see you all in a little yeah, while. Yeah, you got a little bit of time. Maybe if you need some coffee, you can grab that real quick, and we'll start here in a minute. That's a, a lot of time. <laughs> Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. So Scott and Susan, they mentioned that if you want coffee, this is your last chance here in about three minutes, they're going to put that away. So um, if you haven't tried Downtown Vineyard coffee, here's the thing about coffee here at DTV. You actually cannot get that blend anywhere else. You can only get it here on Sunday morning. Yeah. Paul and um, some of our staff at one point went down and they created a little specialty blend for our church. And so, yeah, if you want coffee, special coffee, the Lord's coffee, <laughs> You're going to find it here. I'm sure it probably pairs well with the Lord's chicken. Uh, yeah, with the Lord's chicken. <laughs> Do you know, there's actually a verse in Leviticus, I think it is, that says that you should take the chicken and fry it in the oil. And I think that's where Chick-fil-A took their cues when they were coming up with their secret recipe. <laughs> the what? Oh, Yeah. You know what, guys? We should do our, um, our prayer this morning. If you guys all want to stand with me here at Downtown Vineyard, and we like to start our services together doing a prayer where we just invite the Lord into our space. So um, if you're new here, I'll say a line, and then you guys will just repeat that line in agreement. So if you feel comfortable, go ahead and hold out your hands, and let's pray together. I'm here to receive from you, Lord. I surrender my life to you and your kingdom. I surrender my will to your will. Holy Spirit, I give you permission to speak to me today. And I ask that you open my heart to receive all that you have for me. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and worship this morning. It's a wrong sound on my piano. There we go. <laughs>
week that I was going to go do communion, I was trying to think, what am I going to say about this? And the thing that I felt like God spoke to me was, is a lot of times when I take communion, and I was born and raised in the church, I've taken communion so many times that it almost has become mundane. It's very easy for me to just be thinking about other things while communion is going on, who's going to win the football game today, what Susan's going to make for lunch, all kinds of stuff. So I got... I got to thinking, how do I focus in on communion? And yesterday, in my Bible reading, I read John 3.16. It was part of my daily reading for the year. And 
that scripture that we all know where it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And I thought, man, I've never thought of that as a communion type of verse. This is perfect. That's what communion is all about. How exciting that is that God sent his son, gave us his body and his blood that we can have eternity with him. And I thought, you know how amazing it'd be if, if you won the lottery? how excited you'd be and how happy and, and how much you'd think about it. Well, what we've got, what Christ did for us through giving his body and his blood is way more, way more better, infinitely more better than winning the lottery. So today as we're taking communion, I want you to think about how much God has done for us, giving his body and blood and how we can uh, celebrate with him. It's a celebration. Um, it says in the Bible that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth um, that, that you are saved. So if you've done that, feel free to take communion. It's not a denominational thing or anything. It's uh, just as, as long as God is your, in your heart, uh, feel free to do that. So at this time, uh, they'll release you from the left side, the ushers will, and make your way to the closest communion station.
he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way after supper he took the cup saying this is the cup of the new covenant of my blood do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes father we want to thank you so much for the body that you gave for us that was broken on the cross the sacrifice that was made is so great. God, help us to always remember what you've done for us and what your body being broken has meant that we get to have eternal life with you forever. Let's eat of the bread. And thank you, Father, so much for the blood that was shed for us, God, to cleanse our sins and to unite us again once again with you one day. Let's drink the cup. Amen. back <laughs> I forgot our notes baby oh no I'm gonna grab them <laughs> well we're Scott and Susan Williams we have the privilege of being the marriage pastors down here at the church and we love what we do we do thanks y'all for being sweet with me for getting our notes but I don't want to forget one of the important things we need to tell you one is our marriage tip trip tip today a marriage trip <laughs> Hey, we're going to go on a marriage trip. No, marriage tip. Maybe that was from God, love. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I'm sure. Huh, you wanted, this is your marriage tip. You came up with this. Okay. What, what we've always tried to get couples to encourage couples to do is to find a couple or two that have a healthy marriage. Because you, when you hang out with people that are healthy, you have a tendency for ha to have that rub off on you. Now, if you hang out with all the wrong people, it's just like when you're raising your kids. You want to see them have good friends mm -hmm. and not bad friends. So find a healthy couple. Or two. It may be hard to find sometimes, but uh, everybody, hey, everybody has their issues. But You can come to our marriage class and find some, I promise. But it's true. Birds of a feather flock together. We rub off on each other. Yes. That was a good marriage tip, honey. Yes. Y'all, did we say welcome? I don't know. Well, welcome, everyone. <laughs> We're so glad you're here. Oh, goodness, we're a little discombobulated today. Uh, we're so glad you're here yeah. in service and online. So glad that you're joining us. It's time to do the Connect card. So for those of you that have your phone and you, you want to shoot the QR code either on the screen if you're watching online or in the app, I think it's in the app as well. Uh -huh. If you get in the, in the, on our website, you can pull that up. It's a chance for us to know what's going on in your lives, what to pray for, what to give thanks for, for the good things that's going on, 
It helps you connect with what's going on at the church. There, there is so much that goes on here. I mean, there's no way you can keep up with it unless you have some help, like what, through the website. So yeah. um, if you'll do that and fill that out, we'd really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Um, Scott mentioned the app. If you haven't downloaded the app, y'all, it's really handy. We are an app society. So I see head shaking. Yes, the app is great, you guys. So you can look for that in the app store, Downtown Vineyard. Um, Scott and I are going to be in the start here corner. That's this, is that the west? What's, anyway, it's right back there, y'all. That it's, corner. It's one, of, one of the four directions. There's a sign above it that says start here corner. We will be back there to answer any questions that you have. Maybe you want to get involved in something and you just want a little more information. You want to volunteer somewhere. We need a little more information. If you're new, we have a gift for you, and we would love to meet you. So please, if you're new and we haven't got to meet you yet, stop by. Introduce yourself. We would love that, and we we want to give you that gift too. Now we have a middle school camp coming up October 11th and 13th. Is that next weekend? Through 11th through 13th. I think that's next weekend. That's at Camp Cedar Ridge, and I love... I grew up at Camp Cedar Ridge. We both did. We have so many fond memories. If y'all didn't grow up going to camp as kids, the experience is incredible for your kiddos. So pray about it, think about it, sign your kids up. You can do that on the app or on the website. Um, And that's where you will register is online. That's all we have. We've got a video for you to watch. And then... I believe Pastor Paul is going to be, there he is, hi Paul. Paul's <laughs> going to be coming up for, to teach us today. Thanks y'all. Women around the world lead very different lives, but in many ways are more alike than what we realize. Just like you, women in Nepal or El Salvador want to be loved. Just like you, mothers in Kenya and the Philippines do everything they can to provide for their families. Just like you, girls and daughters in Bulgaria and Haiti want to know their futures can be bright and filled with promise. But many are held back, held back by circumstances outside of their control, lacking opportunities which prevents them from rising up and becoming all God intends them to be. Sometimes a woman's only way out is through someone just like you. Together, let's be the voice for our sisters and daughters around the globe who are in desperate need. Because if you change her story, you can change the world. Join us for our third annual Christmas Market and Craft Show and support Convoy of Hope's Women Empowerment Program. To register as a vendor, visit dtvchurch.org. All right. Good morning. Hey, kids, we have not released you yet, and there is Sunday school for you. Linnea, would you meet the kids in the hallway? If you uh, are still in the auditorium, just know Linnea will meet you down in the hallway and make sure you get to class. Anyway, hey, the Women's Empowerment is amazing. Linnea and I got to be a part of a Women's Empowerment program when we were in El Salvador last year. Uh, Unbelievably life-changing. The craft fair that we host, the proceeds go to Women's Empowerment. Before we get there, though, um, I want to show you one more Convoy of Hope video, because last week we could, took our One Day to Feed the World um, uh, offering. We raised over $16,000. That's amazing. And ironically, it came on the very same day that um, uh, uh, Hurricane Helen hit uh, uh, the Asheville, North Carolina area, and on um, Friday night, I got a video from um, uh, Hal Donaldson, who is the president of um, Convoy of Hope. He is saying this is the greatest catastrophe that's ever hit the United States. Check out this video. This is, where, this is where, why we support Convoy of Hope. Hello, this is Hal Donaldson of Convoy of Hope, and today I'm standing in Swannanoa, North Carolina, which was devastated by Hurricane Helene. This is already considered one of the worst natural disasters in American history. I've traveled to hundreds of disaster zones, including Katrina, the earthquake in Haiti, and the tsunami in Indonesia. And this is one of the worst I've ever seen. This will be a long-term response for Convoy of Hope. We plan to be here for many months, helping survivors put their lives back together. 
And as the country mourns the lives that have been lost and as families search for those who are still missing, Convoy of Hope response teams and volunteers from churches and businesses are on the ground in places like this, hard hit areas. We're distributing food and water and emergency supplies in six states, North and South Carolina, Florida, Georgia, Virginia, and Tennessee. Now to date, more than 100 semi-truck loads of supplies have been distributed and many more truckloads are on the way. I just wanna say on behalf of the families and children ravaged by this hurricane, thank you. Thank you for partnering with us to bring them help and hope during these uncertain times. In the coming weeks, undoubtedly, news coverage of this tragedy will wane, but the needs of those affected will be ongoing. With your help, we pledge to be here for the long haul. But God bless you, and thank you again for caring and giving. I love that. Let's, let's, let's pray. Lord, we're just coming before you, and we just say, we thank you. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. The Lord, that you are sovereign over all. And so, Lord, we lift up those that uh, have been affected by Hurricane Helen. We ask that you keep your hands upon them. We ask that during this season of many people's grief, Lord, that you would use the local church to bring hope. And Lord, this morning, we lift up our tithes and our offerings to you. And we just say, we commit them to you, and we say, use them for your kingdom. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I was like, you're shutting the lights off on me. They're like, you're done. You're done. You know, there's this interesting thing. If you, if you have been with us, we're in uh, Genesis chapter 43 this morning. You can flip your Bibles over there. We're going to read verses 15 through 31. Verses 15 through 34. There's this thing that we see when we're reading the story of Genesis, and we're watching the story of Genesis, and what we are really looking for in the story of Genesis is how God redeems his people. And we're looking for the fact that God always has a plan for his people. If God has a plan for his people, that means that God has a plan for you. And this is the, this is the story of Genesis, that whether they go through um, it, whatever trials they're in, you just see, you continually see God showing up and saying, I've got a plan for you, I've got a plan for you, I've got a plan for you. That if you trust me, all things will work together for the good of those that are in Christ Jesus. If you trust me, I will get you to where you need to be. And this is the story of um, Genesis. And so there's this question we're going to look at today. And the question I'm going to ask this morning is, what does redemption look like? I don't know if you've ever thought about that. I don't know if you've ever gone through something that you're like, Lord, like, why, what is this about? I don't know if you've ever had a relationship that's fallen apart. I don't know if you've ever had anybody betray you. But as a Christian, there's a space that as Christians, we do not have the option of unforgiveness. Isn't that interesting? Like the whole world, unforgiveness is one of their options. If, if you're not a believer in Jesus, you can come to this moment and you can have these moments where you're like, you're like, nope, I don't believe it. Nope, those people can take a hike. I will never, ever, ever talk to them again. I will never, ever, ever trust them again. I will never ever, ever. I'm going to cut them out of my life. But if you're a believer in Jesus, that's not on the table. That's not an option. That's not how our faith works. And so then you have to ask this different question. If unforgiveness is not an option for a believer, then what does redemption look like? When am I called to let people back into my life? How am I called to let people back in my life? There's two passages that I think about even before we get to the passage we're going to look at. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, um, Paul is talking to the church of Ephesus, and there's this thing that's going on, and they're angry. And they have the right to be angry. And they're kind of holding on to this bitterness. And then Paul writes in this letter, and he says, he says no, no, that's not how it works. He says, you should get rid of all bitterness, all rage, all anger. You should get rid of your harsh words and your slander, as well, of, as, well as all types of evil behavior. I don't know if you've ever had somebody angry or if you've ever been angry, but when you're angry, it's really easy to do really evil behavior. 
It's really easy to be like, I'm going to get them, those people back. Uh, you know what I'm going to do? This is what I'm going to do. And Paul's saying, don't do it. He says, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. He also says to the church of Colossus, Colossians, he says, remember the Lord forgave you, so you should forgive others. And if you're able to forgive them, then you have to ask this question. And this is the question we're going to ask this morning. How do you let people who have wronged you back into your life? That's a good question. Is, is, am I the only one that thinks that's a good question? Like, that's a good question. Everybody in this room probably has somebody. If, if I was to ask you to think of somebody right now, and you're like, Paul, I don't want to think about them. I don't want to think about them. I don't want to think about them. So please forgive me for making you think about them. Everybody has people in your life that you've gone like, I don't care if I ever see that person again. Amen. All right, yes, okay, I've got two or three people who are honest with me this morning. And so then the question comes back, if the Lord tells us we can't give up on those relationships, then how, then how do you trust someone again? How do you trust somebody who's wronged you? In Genesis chapter 43, there's this moment for, for um, Joseph. Joseph is literally just going about his daily life. He's, he's second in command of all of Egypt. Um, God has restored him. God has now given him uh, several boys. He, he literally named his boys in such a way, he's like, this is my son who has restored my belief in God. This is my son who took away all of my pain in the land of pain. And he has these moments, and he's married to this beautiful girl, and he's got these two wonderful children, and he has this great job. And as he's going through life, his life looks great, but his pain is still deep. And one day he looks up, and standing in front of him, standing directly in front of him, are his, two, are his ten brothers who beat him, tried to kill him, and then sold him into slavery, and they are standing right in front of him. And now he has this encounter with the very people that he probably has the deepest, darkest hurt around. In this moment, he has a choice that he has to make. And the choice is, how will he treat the people who have hurt him? He then begins to, um, he, he gives them the grain they're looking for, he sends them back home, and he sends them back home with this little um, one caveat he says, listen, he says, I think you guys are spies. I think you're spying on the land. And he says, and um, you, can't, you can't come back here until you bring your little brother with you. And just to make sure that you're going to come back, I'm going to hang on to your oldest brother, Simeon. Simeon is the one who sold him into slavery. It was his idea. And, and Joseph has this moment where he's trying to figure out how he has relationships with these 10 men. And so in verse 15 it says, So the men packed up Jacob's gifts and doubled the money and headed back with Benjamin. And so what happens is they've gone back home, they've um, told, told their father about what has happened, and now they've got to get more grain or they're going to die. And um, the, the brothers have said, we can't go back without Benjamin. And Joseph, uh, Jacob has said, you can't take my youngest son. I don't know what I would do if something happens to him. And the rest of the brothers say, well, we can't go back without him. And so Jacob says, okay, you guys go ahead and go back. Take him with you. And so they finally arrived in Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the manager of his household, these men will eat with me this noon. Take them inside the palace, then go slaughter an animal and prepare a big feast. So the man did as Joseph told him and took them into Joseph's palace. The brothers were terrified when they saw that they were being taken into Joseph's house. They don't know who he is, but they know that this can't be good. So it says, it's because of the money someone put in our sacks last time we were here. They said, he has plans to pretend we stole it, and then he will seize us and make us slaves and take our donkeys. Because that's what Joseph needs are a few more donkeys. The brothers approached the manager of Joseph's household and spoke to him at the entrance of the palace. Sir, they said, we came to Egypt one, three, four, to buy food. But as we were returning home, we stopped for the night and we opened our sacks 
Then we discovered that each man's money, the exact paid, was in the top of his sack. Here it is. We've brought it back with us. We also have additional money to buy more food. We have no idea who put our money in our sacks. The servant said, relax, don't be afraid. The household manager told them, your God, the God of your fathers, must have put this treasure into your sacks. I know I received your payment. And then he released Simeon and brought him to them. The manager then led the men into Joseph's palace. He gave them water to wash their feet and provided food for their donkeys. They were told they were going, uh, would be eating um, there, so they prepared their gifts for Joseph's arrival at noon. And when Joseph came in, they gave him the gifts they had brought him. They bowed low to the ground before him. After greeting them, he asked, How is your father, the old man you spoke about? Is he still alive? Yes, they replied, Our father, your servant, is alive and well. And they bowed low again. Then Joseph looked at his brother Benjamin, the son of his own mother. This is your youngest brother, the one you told me about, Joseph asked. May God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried from the room because he was overcome with emotion for his brother. He went into his private room where he broke down and wept. And after washing his face, he came back out, keeping himself under control. Then he ordered, bring out the food. Wouldn't that be a fun thing to say? Hey, bring out the food. And then all this food just starts coming out. The waiters served Joseph at his own table, and his brothers were served at a separate table. The Egyptians who ate with Joseph sat at their own table because the Egyptians despise Hebrews and refused to eat with them. Joseph told each of his brothers where to sit, and to their amazement, he seated them according to the age from oldest to youngest. Now catch this very last verse. And Joseph filled their plates with food from his own table giving Benjamin five times as much as he gave the others. So they feasted, and they drank freely with him. I want you to catch this. This is a super important passage. It's kind of between these moments. It's, it's between the moment where Joseph runs into his brothers and between the moment where Joseph fully forgives his brothers. I don't know if you've ever been in that place where you've had somebody who's hurt you. You've had somebody who's done great damage to your family, and now you're in this space where you're face to face with them, or maybe it's a family reunion, or maybe you run into them and you catch up with them, but you're in between this place, the place between fully forgiving somebody and figuring out how to forgive somebody. That's a really weird spot. And this is actually a really weird passage because when we come to this passage, nothing has been resolved. All we have in this passage is tons of hurt and tons of emotion. And so there becomes a space for Christians. How do you forgive people who have mistreated you? Joseph has no obligation to them. They've sold him into slavery. He's been sold as a slave. He's now been made to second in power. He has no obligation to them. They have no idea who he even is. If he totally sent them with grain and sent them on their way, he would never ever have to engage with them again. He has the right to even throw them in jail. And they would still not know. And so there comes this space for Joseph where he has no obligation with them. They don't know who he is. And he has to make a decision about how does a godly man move forward. You know, most of us view family relationships through our family of origin. Do you understand that? Whatever you watched your mom and dad do is most likely what you will end up doing. Even if you say, I will never be like my dad. Come on. And even if you say, I will never be like my mom. It's the craziest thing. You can say that all you want to, but until you take a marriage class, until you get a mentor in your life, until you get some other like skills, you oftentimes end up doing exactly what they did. Joseph's brothers did exactly what Jacob did. Jacob did exactly what um, Israel did. Like they just, like Abraham they did the same thing, and they had this way that they acted in their family of origin. In their family of origin, they had this history of they put themselves first, and they took advantage of anybody that they could. This was their family of origin story. It had gone on for family after family after family after family. If you have a family of origin story, maybe your family avoids conflict. Maybe your family doesn't talk about hard things. 
If you have a family of origin story, maybe actually whenever you fight, you think that the object is to win by hurting the other person. And so you know how to say mean things, you know how to do mean things, you know how to um, manipulate the situation to get exactly what you want. And maybe you don't even like your behavior, but this is what comes out of you when you fight. And so Jacob found himself in the same position that he found himself trying to figure out how he navigates his family. Instead of doing what he's always done, he's trying to figure out a new way to move forward. And so how do you know when it's time to let people back in your life? How do you know when you should give up on people? And how do you know when you should give people a second chance? I'm going to give you three rules. Here's the first rule. The first rule is, you can't let people back into your life until you're strong enough to handle their bad behavior. This is the first rule. Like, you can't let people back into your life until until you are strong enough to handle their bad behavior. If you're not strong enough to forgive them, then you're not strong enough to spend time with them. Do you want me to say that again? If you're not strong enough to forgive them, then you're not strong enough to spend time with them. If they still trigger you every time you're with them, if they still abuse you every time you're with them, if they still hold things over you every time you're with them, then you're not in a position to spend time with them. There's a passage in Proverbs 24.10. It's actually one of my favorite passages when it comes to this particular topic. It just simply says this. It says, if you fell under pressure, your strength is too small. Duh. Like, like duh, right? Like, it just, if you fell under pressure, if when you are in that moment, and every time you come to that moment, you just kind of, like, you kind of cave. You kind of, like, fall apart. You come to the moment, and then you kind of fall apart. He says, if your strength, if, if you fell under pressure, your strength is too small. He's literally saying, don't put yourself in positions that you can't handle. You see, I love the story of Jesus. I love the story that Jesus is continually a story of redeeming us. And I love the fact that Jesus calls us to hold our relationships in such a way that we ask him to redeem them. Like, this is how it works. Oftentimes, we think that because we're in the redemptive story, we oftentimes think that this is the time that he's redeeming. You know what? Joseph literally spent 22 years before before he was engaged again. 22 years went by before the Lord allowed Joseph's brothers back into his life. There was a process that Joseph had to go through before he was in a position to be in a position to receive his brothers. You see, I believe that when I say you can't let people back into your life until you're strong enough to be able to handle their bad behavior, I believe that there is often times, time that is needed for you to go through what you're going through before you can allow them to get back into your life. you gotta give, you got to give it time. you got to give it you got to let it simmer. Here's the second thing that I believe. I believe that Joseph didn't let his brothers back into his life until he was able to see that their character had changed. Like this was the moment. Like Joseph was looking for, when, when, when his brothers are confronted, when his brothers are standing before him, his first emotion is, oh my gosh, these are the ones who hurt me. And he had many options. He could have had them thrown into jail. He could have um, dismissed them, gave them food, and said, never come back. You guys, you guys are Hebrews. Never come back. I'll give, you, I'll give you grace one time. He had a ton of options. But what Joseph started doing was Joseph started looking to see if their character had changed. Just because someone tells you they've changed doesn't mean they've changed. Can I say that again? Just because someone's told you they've changed doesn't mean they changed. Anybody want to say amen to that? Amen, right? People will tell you who they are by what they do. I'll say that again. People will tell you, people will show you who they are by what they do. Jesus says in Matthew 5.18, 
He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus says, but like, there's this problem amongst believers. Believers say, I love, I love the Lord, I love the Lord, I love the Lord, I love the Lord. But when he watches their actions, he's like, you guys give it a lot of lip service. Like, you say you love me, but your actions don't show you love me. Jesus is saying that these people, they say all the right things. They just don't do the right things. They say they love me. They say they put me first. They say they worship me. In Isaiah, which is where Jesus is taking this passage from, Jesus is literally quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting Isaiah. That particular passage says, their worship is a farce. He says, they honor me with their lips, but their worship is a farce. Joseph's brothers were saying all the right things. If you flipped back one chapter, you'd find these two passages in Genesis chapter 42. You'd find these two passages where they're standing before Joseph, and Joseph says, hey, I think you guys are spies. I don't think you're even supposed to be in the land. I think you're checking this out. And you know what they say? They say, oh, no, no, Lord. We're honest men. Oh, don't you know that that drove Joseph crazy? Oh, yeah, you honest men sold your little brother into slavery. Yeah, way to go. Way to be honest, man. And he says, he says, no, no, no. I think you're here to spy on my land. I think you're here to find out that we're weak. And then they say, no, 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 Lord. We're trustworthy. And you know what Joseph does? He goes, all right, we'll see. Come on, we'll see. So Joseph starts testing them. He puts their money back in their sack. And he's like, okay, we're going to give them their money back, and we're going to see what they do with that. And they come back, and they're like, hey, man, somebody put our money back in our sack. We didn't steal it. And he looks up, and he goes, oh, their character's changed. He's testing them. He's, he's looking to see if they have any remorse. He says, I'm going to put their oldest brother in jail. It, their past history, were, they were men who didn't care about anybody but themselves, and they were willing to sell their little brother for 30 shekels, which is the same amount that they sold Jesus for, which becomes prophetic about how you handle people who will sell you out. And all of a sudden, Joseph is in this moment, and he's like, you guys don't even care about your own family. And they take Simeon, the one that sold him, the one that it was his idea, he puts him in jail, and he thinks to himself, you know what, if these guys are the people I think they will, they're just going to leave and go home, and they're going to forget all about Simeon. And 30 days later, they come back and they say, Lord, here's the money that we told you we'd bring. Here's our little brother because we told you we'd bring him. And Lord, how's our brother Simeon? You see, what you're looking for is when you have people in your life that have hurt you and they want to be back in your life, you're looking to see if they've changed. How's their character? Do they have any remorse anymore about their actions? Are they the type of people that will sell people out and continue to sell people out? Do they only care about themselves? Or will they learn from their mistakes and learn to protect people that they've hurt? Will they take responsibility for their actions? I love this passage because Reuben looks up at his dad and he says, Dad, he says, I don't know what to do. He said, you want me to go back and you want me to get more grain. But if we go back and we don't have our little brother with us, then the only thing that's going to happen is we're all going to be thrown into jail. And he looks at his dad and he says, Dad, I promise you, I will take care of Benjamin. I will make sure to take care of Benjamin. And there's this moment for Reuben where Reuben has had 22 years of regret. 22 years to think about the pain and the choices that he's made. And so there has to be a space that we as believers give people grace for the hurt that they did. I know that that's really hard when somebody's hurt you. It's easy to say, well, forgive them because, you know, they, they didn't hurt you. They maybe hurt somebody else in your family. And there's this space in where you look up. And you know, if, it, if it didn't happen to you, it's easy to ask people to be kind and be forgiving and be loving. But when you're trying to work out the pain, Joseph begins to test them in small things before he trusts them in the large things. You see, wise people have to look up and you begin to look for character change. Are they trustworthy? Do they have any remorse? Do they lie when they get under pressure? Do they only look out for themselves? You see, here's the third thing. I want to give you the third thing. The third thing is this. 
and this is huge. I'm going to say this twice. You can't let people back into your life until you can hold them accountable without holding them hostage. I'm going to say it again. You can't let people back into your life until you're able to hold them accountable without holding them hostage. Paul writes to the church of Colossians, and he says this in um, Colossians 3.13. He says, remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. He, he's saying that when you let people back into your life, you can't do it with strings attached. Like this whole idea that you let people back into your life because, because you're the forgiving one. But you're going to remind them of how much they hurt you. That's actually not godly. That's actually not how relationships work. That you're going to let them back in your life, but you're going to hold them hostage, and, and you're going to remind them of all the years that you spent hurting and ostracized by the family, and you're going to, you're going to hold it over their head and say, you know what, I'll forgive you, but don't you ever do that to me again. You see, there's this space for Jesus. That Jesus forgives us, and he does so, without holding us hostage for our sin. When he forgave your sins, Scripture says that he, he, he throws them as far as the east is from the west. That you're not forgiven and reminded that you're a sinner. That when Jesus forgives you, he doesn't keep calling you a sinner saying, hey, you're still, you're still broken. You're, like, this is this thing in Christianity. We do this thing, like, I'm, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, but I'm still a sinner. No, when you, Jesus forgave you, you became righteous. You became forgiven. You became whole. You became a saint. Because we don't forgive people and hold them hostage. There is wisdom in testing. There is wisdom in granting forgiveness and testing character. There is forgiveness, there is wisdom in granting forgiveness and testing one's actions. Joseph began by giving them a little bit of grain and saying, hey, I'll give you more if you bring your little brother back. And they came forward and said, hey, listen, we need a little bit more grain, but not only is we, did we bring our brother back, but we brought the money that we needed for it, and we brought the money that somebody put back in our sacks. Joseph gave them forgiveness, and he tested them, and he gave them food from his table and he put them in order. You see, I believe this. As believers, you've got to use wisdom on when you allow people back into your life. But you can't allow people back into your life if you're going to hold them hostage. Christ-centered relationships forgive even when they will never forget. You want me to say that again? As Christians, as followers of Jesus, that doesn't mean that you forget what happened. It means that you forgave what happened. And that we are called to let people back into our lives. And we are called to hold them accountable. But we are not called to hold them hostage. I'm going to invite our ministry team to come forward in just a moment. Here's going to be my prayer for us as we close. My prayer is that just like Joseph's family, as dysfunctional as it was, as broken as it was, my prayer is that God would redeem your family. My prayer is that you would have healthy relationships with people who hurt you. And my prayer is that God would heal your hurts. And that as he heals your hurts, that he would give you wisdom and discernment and that you would trust him to be your redeemer and you would trust him that he can heal your family and you would trust him that he can heal your broken heart you see this this story that we're walking through the story that we're in the story of joseph and his family is actually a story of redemption and it's actually a story that god that god has a plan for jacob's family and God has a plan to heal Joseph's hurts and that God allows us hope in spite of all of our brokenness. And so this morning, this morning I'm going to ask as we go into this last song, 
if the Lord's doing something in your life and you would like prayer, I'm going to ask our ministry team to come forward. And I'm going to ask us all to stand for the song. And if you have something going on in your life and you'd like prayer, we would love to pray with you. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence while well, I speak Jesus. Well, I just want to speak the name. Jesus, till every dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom, oh, I speak Jesus, cause your name is power. topic is there's more going on in the seat than maybe there's going on in the front I know that God wants to redeem your family I know that God wants to redeem your relationship and maybe you're on the side where you received the pain like all the pain came your way like Joseph and maybe you're on the side where it's like dude I blew up my family so hard I don't know that they're ever going to forgive me. I don't know how God's ever going to work that out. Here's the deal. 
I love the fact that you don't even have to know how. All you have to do is trust that He can. Like they're right? Like trust that He can. For 22 years, Reuben walked around and he's like, I don't even know how God could ever make that right. I was supposed to defend my little brother. I had a plan to defend my little brother. And, and like they robbed me of the opportunity to, to, to save my little brother. Simeon walked around with a completely other guilt. He sold Joseph in a heartbeat. He couldn't stand Joseph. Joseph represented everything that made him sick. And for 22 years, he walked around with the one who came up with the plan to kill and sell Joseph. He walked around with guilt. He saw how broken his actions had made his, his dad. And he went, I can't let my dad go through that again. The pain in his heart was deep. He had no idea that God was at work in his life. And I would say this to you this morning. God is at work in your life. God is in the business of redeeming. He's in the business of redeeming families. He's in the re business of redeeming people who have made poor decisions. He's in the business of redeeming brokenness. And even though you don't know how, you can trust that he does. Let's put our hands up. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and then at the end of the prayer, I'm going to lead you in a prayer that will be up on the screens. And so, Lord, we just put our hands out, and we just say, Lord, we know that you are the great redeemer. You are the great healer of families. You are the great, you are the great physician of broken hearts. And so, Lord, we don't know how. We don't know how you do these things. We don't know how you fix things. But, Lord, we lift up our families to you. And we say, Lord, would you, would you redeem them? Would you redeem our poor decisions? Would you redeem our regrets? Would you redeem our mistakes? Would you heal broken hearts today? And Lord, we pray this prayer to you. It just goes like this. Lord Jesus, I need you. And I need your mercy and forgiveness. And I need your spirit to lead me and to guide me. And to teach me your ways so that my life would bring you glory and honor.